Say that church has a revolving door. How many have heard of that? The church has a revolving door. People come in, people go out. And a lot of times within church, and especially over the past uh, 10 years of pastoring here, it seems like that there is a revolving door. I see a lot of new faces over the years, which is great. Uh, but some of those faces who were here and staples and sturdy maybe are not here any longer. But I believe that if we do it right, if we think about why we're here and we think about what we are doing, why are we in this place today, and we think of it as a table and changing chairs rather than revolving doors, I believe that we will see great and awesome things happen in God's house. Father, we thank you. We praise you for who you are. We thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy today in this place. I pray today, Lord God, for clarity. Lord, as I speak, that as I speak this message, Lord God, that it would truly hit the heart of every single person here, God, regardless of what chair they sit in. Lord God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would move in a great and awesome way. Speak to us as only you can. And I pray, God, you'd anoint your servant as he speaks your word. May he speak nothing more, nothing less. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, the church, I believe, is like a table where people come to sit and to be fed. Many of us today, we, we probably came to church to say, man, I need to receive something. I need something. I need some filling. I need some fuel for my week. Maybe some of you have had a very difficult week. Maybe others, it's just kind of a so-so week and you just kind of cruise through. But regardless, we come to church hopefully to be fed. But hopefully that's not the only reason that we come to church. You know, when you think about the church in regards to a table, what is involved in people coming to the table? You know, when you think about the church, hopefully you look around and you see everything that's happening and you say to yourself, this doesn't just happen. How many have ever thought that before? Like, this doesn't just happen. Like, it doesn't magically appear. You know, the praise and worship team probably discusses the songs they're going to play before the, the, the service starts. The message is, is hopefully prayed over and thought through before it's delivered. You know, these guys, they're not operating so much in the spirit that they know exactly what to bring up on the screen, you know, when it happens. They didn't, like, pray and say, God, you know, give me the words. They, they waited on what was being said and what was being spoken, and they know the cues. They know when it's coming on and what to do. Are you with me? The kids' church workers, they showed up early to be there to get ready for the kids that were coming in. Those who were signing people in at the table, they were there early to sign people in and get people going in the right direction. So hopefully, you can look around at the church and see that, man, there's a lot that goes in to people coming to the table. Let, let's talk about this today. Let's talk about getting the table ready getting the table ready, because there are three things, I believe, in regards to getting the table ready. And this really goes hand in hand with having people over to our homes. Now, how many of you go into a frenzy when you're having people over to your home, and maybe they haven't been there that often, or maybe it's the first time. That's always the most unnerving, right? When it's the first time, and people are coming over to your house, if you're anything like me, when I do a clean, it's like a quick clean. You know, I can clean the house quicker than anyone, but it's like you never know when you're going to find it, where you're going to find it, what room it's going to be in, what it's going to be shoved under. And, and Holly always tells me this, like, I really appreciate your help, but I would really appreciate if you'd do it right in the first place. How I many can that resonate with any ladies in the house today? It's like, thank you for your help. I would like if you would do it the right way. So, you know, the first thing, though, that's involved in getting people to come to the table or come to the church is invitation. You know, you don't, you don't find someone out in public and say, why were you not at my house? And they might look at you like, well, you never invited me. And a lot of times we treat church like that, don't we? Why were you not at church? because you never invited me. Now, I'm not talking about those who are born again and in a relationship with Jesus. I don't believe that believers need reminded every Sunday morning, okay, wake up now. You know, five years into this relationship with Jesus and you're getting calls like, just making sure you're gonna make it today. It's not, that's not good to, to have to remind us, hey, it's Sunday. Hey, do you know what happens on Sunday? It's church today. Did you know that? It's been happening now for like centuries. It's amazing. I wanna invite you. No, no, we have to invite people to come to the table. We have to get people to the table. You don't ask, 
Why didn't you show up if you never invited someone? Make no mistake about it, the church should be a place of invite. I desire this church to be a church and have a culture of invitation. That not just for Biker Sunday, but for every service that we do, we are inviting. And sometimes we can forget that. That we are inviting for the event. What is the event? The event is Jesus. If you missed that message, I believe it was a great message because Jesus is the event. Every Sunday morning, we don't have to have a special guest speaker or a special event because Jesus Christ is the event. And we need to have a culture of invitation when getting this table ready. The question is this, who are you inviting? Who are you inviting? You're like, man, I didn't think we were going to get this quick into this and start asking these challenging questions. I want to challenge those who are here today that come to the table week after week. And I ask you this, who are you inviting? Matthew 28, verse 19, the Great Commission, Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's go and make. It is not set and wait. But oftentimes, that's what the table looks like. We are setting, we are waiting to be, to be fed. Please put out the meal. Let's eat. Let's have a good time. Let's get up. Hopefully, you at least push in your chair and you leave. But you see, you don't even have to push in your chair. The seat just folds up for you. Isn't that amazing? It's such an amazing seat that it just folds right up for you. But it is go and make. It is not set and wait. The second thing about getting the table ready is this, the preparation. There is preparation and having people over to your house. Now, if people have been over to my house several times, I really don't care. Actually, the first time, this is the way I roll. If you're coming to my house, I'm comfortable enough for you to be in my home, I really don't care that much. That's me. Now, I know, ladies, you have a different makeup. You want it to be right. You want to make, like, chicken with, you know, bacon wrapped around it with a special sauce and these string green beans that look fancy. You want to bring out the, the plates and all that kind of stuff. If you're anything like me as a man, you're like, listen, I'm bringing them to my house. I don't care what they think of me. I'm, I'm inviting them over. We're already there. Refrigerator rights from invitation is how I work. But now, not everybody works like that. So if I'm ever in your house and I just walk up to your refrigerator, don't be offended. You know, just allow me to get what I want, and it's no big deal. Just take a second. I'm really quick. I'll see it, and I'll say, cool. That's what I want. And then people will be looking at me like, dude, just got in my refrigerator. And it's like, hey, man, you invited me over. Don't invite me if you don't want me to get in your stuff. So... But there's some serious preparation involved, though, when it comes to getting people to sit at the table and to eat. Here's the thing about the table. And really, everything matters. Everything matters. In regards to God's house, everything matters. In regards to bringing people to the table, preparation matters. From the parking lot to the closing prayer, and everything in between and before and after, it matters, doesn't it? You know, a lot of people don't even think about the cleanup that happens when there's anything at all here. You know, you think, wow, this place is so clean. We've heard that time after time after time again. Man, this place is so clean. And it's because people clean it. It's amazing. The spirit moves and just wipes the dust. You know, it's so crazy. Angels come in here and just get out swiffers and, 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 and pledge. And it's just so amazing. The truth is... Someone cleans that. Now you can call them angels or whatever you'd like, but it's preparation, isn't it? Because we care when people are coming to the table what the presentation is like. Are you with me? So, preparation. When preparing the table, we should think about the needs of the unbeliever. When preparing the table, we should think about the needs of the unbeliever. How do you prepare the table when guests come. It's about the guest, isn't it? It's not about those who you eat dinner with every day. It's about the guest. Are you with me? If my kids try to make it about them, when guests come over, they know what's going to happen. I'm going to tell them to be quiet and get out of my face because newsflash, today is not about you. I mean, I don't know if you do with your kids like that, but I do often. So listen, this is not about you today. You are not the guest. And so even in regards to the church house, we have to think about, and even as I prepare a message, I have to think about not only the one who has been saved for 20 years and needs feeding, which we'll get to that later, but I'm thinking about the one who has never heard the gospel message, and I think, how do I prepare this in such a way 
that someone from 5 to 50 to whatever can take something out of this message. We cannot forget about those who are far from Jesus. And we need to be inviting people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who actually want nothing to do with him. We need to say, listen, we would love to have you in God's house this Sunday morning. At the table, you have to put the needs of the guest above the family. Amen to that. You know, we, we, we did something radical this week. Uh, at, our, at our team night, we asked our volunteers and those who are serving, yes, those who are giving their time, energy, and efforts because they love the Lord, we asked them to park in the back parking lot, the parking lot that nobody wants to back. And we said, listen, we know you're serving. We appreciate that. So we need you to park further away. <laughs> but here's the thing. There's a reason why. Because we're thinking about the guest. We're thinking about maybe the person that is their first time. Maybe the person that needs to be comfortable when they walk in this house. Amen. We need to think about everyone in regards to the table. The third thing when getting the table ready is presentation. Presentation. Regardless of what your tradition tells you, you have to present the food in a compelling way. Are you with me? You know, it's just, it's just interesting, the dynamics of restaurants, when you think about it in regards to restaurants. Like when you go somewhere, you will typically pay more. Let's say this, I will. I can't speak for you. I will pay more for something if presented better than the other way. Are you with me? Uh, when, when you sit down and it makes you feel like, wow, this, this is some good presentation. The, the person's not, you know, angry with me. They're not hateful with me. I mean, everybody loves a good old Waffle House from time to time. Listen, I love that. Just someone yell at me when I sit down. Like, what do you want? Well, I'll tell you what I want. I want this mash covered, smothered, and all that. But sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I want to go somewhere where you sit down and it makes you feel nice. You know what I mean? You sit down, you're like, man, this is, this is awesome. Uh, this treatment is good, and I'll pay a little more for that when I feel that way, when the food is presented in such a way. And they can say something on the menu. Now, some of you chicken finger folks, I'm going to lose you on this. I'm sorry. I love chicken fingers too. But if I go out somewhere, I'm not getting chicken fingers. I'm looking for the, the most random, rare thing on the menu and say, I want that. That looks good, and that's what I want to try. Because it's all about presentation. We must do our best in presenting the gospel in a real and a relevant way. One thing that kind of frustrates me, now this is a personal thing, is that when we make things so churchy that the unchurched have no idea what you are saying. We, we say things and they, they think to themselves, what in the heck are they talking about? Are you with me? And so sometimes we have to think, how are we presenting this? So when I'm even thinking about my messages I try to leave out a lot of the Christianese, you know, because when you talk that way, sometimes there's a disconnect from those you're speaking to and maybe those who have been here for a long time. So presentation is key when it comes to the gospel. Jesus Christ was a master at presentation. No, no one could argue that differently because he presented the gospel in so many ways, so many forms. When he brought healing, right, it was through so many ways. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. I say that often, but he's not one thing. He, he mixes it up, he changes it up. When he's talking to the Gentiles, he's talking one way. When he's talking to the Jews, he's talking another way. When he's talking to people in this town, it's one way. In this town, it's another way. Jesus thought about, how am I going to present this? You see, sometimes when we read some of the parables, we have a bit of a disconnect because we don't understand some of the culture, right? But when you're reading the Bible, realize this. Jesus was speaking into a specific culture. So when he was telling these stories, the people who heard the stories, they got it. When they were talking about fishing, they got it. And certain coins, they got it because he was speaking into their culture. And we make the mistake in the church when we don't speak into our culture. Think about the things that are happening in our time, in our era, in our day. We, we, we do a disservice to people when we just, we talk in, in, a, in a way that only people who've been in the church their whole entire life will understand. Presentation is key when it comes to the table. 
Now, I really want to dig in here and dive in. I want to talk about the chairs, the chairs. How many of you are ready to talk about the chairs today? Sweet five, we're going to roll on with it because these five are going to get something great. Listen, there are three chairs around the table right now, and I believe that everyone sits in a chair. Now, that's not a bad thing, but sometimes if you sit in a certain chair too long, you outlast the time frame in which you should be there. Are you with me? So there are three chairs around this table. And I first want to talk about chair one. Chair one. This represents people far from God. This represents those who are not in a relationship with Jesus. It is of my opinion that every single service, there should be people here that are in need of Jesus. There should be people here who I don't care what you were doing last night, what you did this week, you just came in because you felt guilted into it by a family member or something, you said, I'm just going to do this, get it, off, get it off my mind, off their mind, maybe they'll leave me alone. Whatever your reason might be, we are glad you are here today, and this is the right place. Amen. Every, every healthy church has people in chair one. Now, for whatever reason, it's interesting that some places may try to run chair one out, but we want to bring chair one in. This is the guest of honor. This chair is the guest of honor. Everyone wants to reach chair one until chair one is occupied. Let's say that again. Everyone wants to reach chair one until chair one is actually occupied. Well, they dressed weird. Well, they smell weird. Well, I saw what they were doing last week. I know all about them. Are you with me? It's kind of like this. Everybody wants to reach people until you actually start reaching people. Because when you're reaching people, sometimes it's messy. That's right. And people might say things. Well, well, so-and-so goes down there. Well, good. That's great. Someone says, oh, I, I, can't, I can't believe that, that so-and-so's here. That's awesome. One of the best compliments I think we've ever received. I'm not sure if it was supposed to be a compliment or not, but I take it as one. A, a great compliment. Someone said, go down there at Old North Bend Church. They'll let anyone come in. And I thought to myself, that's great. That's great. Thank you for, for being evangelists and, and inviting people to our church. We greatly appreciate that. Now, that's true because chair one should be and be occupied in all of our churches, around all of our tables. We have this unhealthy mindset in, in the church sometimes like, oh, if we get around them, you know, oh, it might rub us the wrong way. Be the light. If you are the light, it exposes any darkness. So darkness cannot harm you. Are you with me? Darkness cannot overwhelm you. Darkness cannot overtake you because the light is always greater than the darkness. Bring chair one in to the table. To be an Acts 2 church, I'm talking about being added to daily. The church being added to daily. We have to take, take the focus to chair one. The Bible says the fields are ripe for harvest. What are we doing to bring chair one in to the table. One of the main questions we must ask as a local church, as a local church, we must ask this question, who are we reaching? Who are we reaching? The deepest churches are one chair churches. I've heard people say, before, well, man, I just want to, I just want to go deeper. You can pick up a Bible for five dollars at Walmart. It's paperback version, but it still reads the same. Go get you one and dive deeper into God's Word. If you are a believer, if you're crying for deeper, then go deeper in God's Word. Some of the deepest churches, in my opinion, are churches that are chair one churches. Because if you are deep in God's Word, you will realize the call to go out and to evangelize. You will realize the importance and how deep it really is to go out and say, listen, I want to tell you about the greatest one of all time, Jesus Christ. Chair one churches are deep churches. Don't talk about going deep if you're not reaching people. Don't, don't talk about you need more if you're not reaching people. That, that was one of the first elementary things about the gospel. Go! 
Go. But many times, but what, what do we do? We sit and wait. Go and make. No, sit and wait. I want someone to prepare a meal for me, and I want to eat, and I want to get real full on this message. Why? That's the question to every message. Why? Why do I want to know more about the word? Why do I want to go deeper? It should ultimately be to give that out into the life of someone else and to affect someone else with what God has placed in you. Let's talk about chair two, what it represents. The new believer. Chair two represents the new believer. Every healthy church has a new believer. Now, this is a baptism plug. It's a great time for it. I know there are many who have given their hearts and lives to Jesus in the recent days. There are only a few that signed up, and we want to make this thing awesome. And if you're contemplating out there today, well, I just want to be in the right place to be baptized. Listen, if you've confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you are living for him, it's time to be baptized. Sign up on that list and do it. Take the plunge because I'm telling you right now, God will do something very special in your life when you say yes to that and make that public declaration that you're following Jesus. New believers, new believers, that chair should be occupied in every single church. Chair two. This chair is a must because it shows that we are inviting people to the table and we are taking them to a new place in Jesus Christ. We've said, come and set, step over the line of faith. Now set and receive what God has for you. Every new believer needs a time where they set and receive. I'll say that. But there is certainly a time when chair two, you have to move. You see, th this table should be a revolving table. We shouldn't see revolving doors. And if we saw a revolving table or revolving chairs, we would see maturity brought into the church. Chair two, this chair should not be occupied for long periods of time. This chair should not be occupied for long periods of time. Hebrews 6, one says, so let us stop going over basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. You see, we're, we're moving on from, from simply salvation. How in the world in the church have we just made it about salvation? Just, just be saved. It's heaven or hell. There is so much more than just that. Missing hell is a byproduct of saying yes to Jesus. That is not how I live my life. I don't live my life in such a way where I'm saying constantly, oh, I'm glad I'm not going to hell. Glad I'm not going to hell. Glad I'm not going to hell. I said yes to Jesus. Hell is the last thing on my mind. Are you with me? Now, I want others to know the reality of heaven and hell, but that is not our single message. That is not our sole message. If people get scared into salvation, are you with me? They'll find joy in something else in the world and they'll walk. They'll take a walk. I've never seen someone be scared to salvation and stay serving, following Jesus for the rest of their days because we're forgetful people. But when you realize what he's done for you, when you realize the cross he bore for you, the sin he took, the shame he carried for you, you are willing to follow him all the days of your life. Chair two should not be occupied for a long time. Now, I want to move on to chair three. This chair represents mature believers. You're here today not because of me. You're here today not because of the band. You're here today not because of even the kids' church or what there is to offer here. You're here today because Christ has transformed your life and you want to be plugged into the body of Christ. You want to be a vital part of it. You want to be used. You want to say, here am I, send me. You are a mature believer. I was having a conversation with someone a couple weeks ago and we were talking about our church and I said, I think, I think we're close, but I still think we have a ways to go when it comes to the maturity of the church because a mature church realizes that it's on all of us to do it all. That it's not just one person's job to share the gospel. It's all of our job to share the gospel. As a believer in Christ, it's not just my responsibility to sit here and prepare a message for you. It's all of our responsibility to live out the Great Commission. That is what maturity looks like when we are all concerned with salvation. 
when we are all concerned about a lost humanity, when we are all concerned about the depth and the growth of our lives spiritually. It's chair three. Some who sit here in chair three, they occupy the chair, but they don't operate from it. Some in chair three occupy the chair, but they don't operate from it. You see, chair three, you can't just sit in chair three. If, if, if you know anything about my wife at all, when someone comes over to our house, she, she hardly ever in chair three. I gotta tell her to sit down sometimes in chair three, you know what I mean? Like always just washing something, doing something, and making sure everybody's ready. And, and if I know all these people that are at my house, I'm like, baby, why don't you sit down? Sit down and, and, and enjoy your stuff. But she, she understands something, that it is, it is her house, it is her table, so she wants to serve. Man, she realizes that she can't, can you imagine, you, you went over to someone's house, they invited you over, they made a great meal, they prepared it, and then when you got there, you'd never been there before, and you knocked, and no one came to the door. I always try to meet people on the porch or whatever, you know. Sometimes I don't. If, if I didn't meet you, that means I love you even that much more. Uh, can you imagine coming into that house and the person that is serving the food is just chilling at the table? They don't really have any welcome for you. You come and you sit down at the table with them and all the food's over there. It looks really good. And you guys just sit down. Looking at each other awkwardly. You're thinking to yourself, is someone going to say, let's get this thing rolling, or let's start this, you know, the, the initiation, is this going to happen? But no, the person that's serving the food to you is just sitting there. They're just occupying the chair, and you sit there for an hour, and no one says anything. Can you imagine? Oftentimes, churches can look like that, where there are chairs being occupied, but they are not being used. That There are chairs being occupied, but no one is operating from chair three. I'm, I'm glad that we have some people here that won't just occupy the chair, but they operate from chair three. Yeah. Don't, don't talk about maturity and that you're a mature believer if you're not operating yeah. in chair three. This chair should be known by the example it gives, not by the talk it talks, but by the walk it walks. Are you with me? Even, I don't know if you've ever been around People like that, they try to convince you how mature they are in the Lord. I don't, maybe, maybe that's just me. Maybe, I, I, I don't even like people knowing what I do because it's so, it's so funny how so many people mature in the Lord so quickly when they find out I'm a pastor. It's just so amazing. It's crazy. They find out, they, you're a pastor. Praise the Lord. Oh, bless God, man. That's just great. I, I tell you what, just the other day, they start telling me what they was doing. I'm like, you ain't doing that. You, ain't, you, didn't, do, you didn't do that. One time I'm going to try it. Sometime out in public, not in this town, maybe another town if they find out. I'm just going, I'm just going to look at them and say, you did not do that. <laughs> it's so funny how, how people will try to convince you of the maturity. You will see maturity. You'll sense it. No one has to convince you of it. You'll know it. James 1, says this. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Amazing, right? Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Chair three can't say, I'm not getting fed. I want you to think about that. Chair three cannot say, I'm not getting fed. And here's the reason why. If you're mature, you know how to feed yourself. If you're mature, you know how to feed yourself. You know how to open God's word. You know how to read God's word. You know how to pray. You'll dive in. You'll seek his face. You'll get victory. Amen. That's what mature believer looks like because you have to lead others to Jesus. Now, you need encouraged. Summer session was awesome for me. I got to sit there and people were preaching and man, I was stirred up. I'm like, this is great. But guess what? The next week came and I couldn't just sit back and be like waiting around on someone to show up, Justin Enoch, to come to my house. Like, I need to call Justin over, make sure like he, he speaks into my life right now so I can get something ready for next week. No, it's an amazing thing. You dive into God's word and he speaks to you through his word. Chair three. The church, I believe, is able to function properly 
because of the faithfulness of chair three. Chair three people are faithful people. You know where they are. You know what they're doing. You know what they are about. We need all these chairs represented at the table in the church. The new believer, well, that's here. The person far from Jesus. And we need chair three, the mature believer. But I do want to mention one more chair. I don't want to give it a whole lot of credit, but it's chair four. Every church has got one. It's the high chair. We, have a, we actually have a lot of high chairs up in here. Well, that's going to sound bad once I start getting into the points. What I meant was we have a lot of babies here. Let's just preach. Let's just go on. Let's move on. So the high chair. Every church has the high chair. Here's the thing. This is, this is a chair where I want more worship. I want more Bible. I want more fellowship time. I need this. Would you feed me? I need that. Well, I'm just not getting everything I need. I'm just not getting everything I want. Can you just please just a little bit more? I need some of that. Are you with me? Chair four, the high chair. No one's, no one's, I think, excited about this because you're like, I don't, is he talking about me? I don't know. You have to know. That's not my call. But the truth of the matter is, Many churches are ran by the high chair. Right? Less fog. It's water mist, by the way. It's a joke. No one got it. Man, it's a bad time for a joke. Again. Piano starts. Everybody thinks he's serious now. He just threw a joke. Can I laugh during the piano? Sure, sure you can. It's okay. You see, the, the high chair can run a lot of churches because people sit and they say, I need this, I need that. And churches revolve a lot of times around the high chair. Here's the deal. I have four kids in my house and I'll just say the high chair never really worked out a whole lot. It's just kind of like, we're one of those parents that's like, just go over there. As long as you're taking care of yourself until we're done eating, we'll feed you something, you know. <laughs> Man, maybe we should do that in church. It's like this with my kids. They've got four kids. They're kind of spread out now, you know, 10, 8, 3, and 1. Uh, River, of course, being the youngest. All, all of our kids have that time where the high chair is acceptable, okay? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this. If all of my kids were still sitting in the high chair, screaming at us what they need, what they want, River doesn't talk yet. I think he can. I actually think he can speak full sentences, but he's just bullcrapping us, you know? He's like, I'm just gonna grunt about everything, you know? And they, they have no idea and just yell until they do what I want. Ah, ah, you want this? Ah, ah, you want that? Ah, do, do you not like this? Ah, no idea, man. Change your grunts up at least or something. Do something for me. The truth of the matter is, if all of our kids were sitting and screaming from the high chair, that would be insanity, right? It's okay when they can sit in the high chair, they can be fed. But if they're 10, if they're eight, if they're, if they're five, if they're three, it's like, listen, you can feed yourself. My kids know what's gonna happen. If we're tending to the needs of one of the ones that actually need it and they come up and they start yelling all this stuff, they know, they know that a hand is coming from somewhere, somehow, and hitting some portion of their body. And if you're around mama, it don't matter where. She just, she's going to get you. It don't matter. From the top of the head to the soles of the feet, you know, we pray that prayer sometimes. I mean, you need to pray that when she starts swinging at the kids. From the top of the head to the soles of the feet. Bless them, Lord. But guess what? Because we don't want them to think it's all about you. As cute as Belle is, she, you know, she's right on that verge. You got those kids that are on the verge, like they're so cute. I mean, no, I'm talking about, listen, if, if they're eight, that's gone. That was, that's done. That, that sh ship sailed a long time ago. Bell's three. So she's right on that verge of like it's cuteness. And she comes up and interrupts and tries to talk and say stuff. And I look down at her sometimes. She looks so sweet. And I'm like, Bell, you need to be quiet. This ain't about you. She's gone. They need to know that. Because it's very important in the church to not make it about the high chair to not make it all, all, all about yourself and all about your needs. It's about others. It's about others. It's about teaching and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are desperate for it. Why, why does all this matter? Why, 
does all this matter? I believe because there's a world in need of Jesus. We can't have a table, we can't have a church that just revolves around one thing, one person. It matters where we are and what we're doing to move forward. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, listen, you should be maturing in faith. And I say that because I love you. I really do. You should be maturing in faith. Something I'm reminded of that I wrote down years ago in a book talking about vision for a church. And this was, this was before we ever built even the first building. I can remember pinning this down in a book. And I said, God, I desire to see a church of people that know how to lead others to Jesus. This is back when I was 20 years old writing this. I desire to see a church, God, of people that know how to lead others to Jesus, that know how to get in your word, that know how to pray, that know how to go out and how to minister and how to evangelize, that know, that know what it means to be a mature believer in you. That was my prayer and that's still my prayer today. That we have a church where people are changing chairs. Far from Christ, new believer, mature. I thank God that I've seen that happen in so many of your lives. <laughs> you started out there and I, and I saw you come here, and then I saw you come here. The beautiful thing is you skipped that all together, and I'm thankful. Amen. But that's what, that's what growth looks like. That's what growth looks like. You see all these people here this morning, think, man, how, how did this happen? This is how it happened. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Because people realize the importance of the invite, the preparation, the presentation. They know the importance of changing chairs. The church, what are we? We are a place and we are a people that lead others to Jesus Christ. Let's stand to our feet this morning.